Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Business from the Bass Boat on the Serious Angler Network, powered by X2 Power. And guys, today we've got a super cool show lined up, something that is uh, unique, in my opinion, in the fishing industry. And you can just tell through this guy's passion about what he's so passionate about what he's building. Um, but before we get into that, I am about to jump on a plane here. When this episode airs on the Monday, I will be on Lake Champlain fishing the last event as a co-angler um, in the, for me anyway, in the Toyota series for the wild card uh, division. So I'm excited to see where that ends up. I'm sitting good in the points now, but that stuff kind of changes, especially as more tournaments go and more guys fish some of the end of the year wild card stuff in the points, but um, didn't do well in the first Toyota series as a boater. So I said, I'm going to learn something and fish some of these, uh, these fisheries I've never been to and see some cool stuff. So jumped into stuff as a co-angler and, uh, now we're, we're sitting at looking, making the championship. So that would be uh, really cool. I'd love to get to Gunnersville. I've never been there either. So, um, it's been a, it's been a really cool learning year for me. And then also just this fall, we've got some, uh, championships at a chance at our last week's guest, Rick Pierce, giving away bass boats, uh, in, uh, the ABAs, the Western ABAs that is. So, um, excited for this fall. It's about to get real hectic here. Um, but speaking of co-angler stuff, this guy also has some incredible co-angler stories because he fished as a co-angler on the Elite Series for a while back when that was occurring. So um, without further ado, we're going to bring in Marcos of Waterwood Custom Baits and uh, dig into everything that he's got going. He's got a lot of history in this industry, and uh, let's bring him in. Marcos, how are you? Doing good, buddy. How are you doing, Aiden? Doing, doing really good. It is... Uh, it's it's good man we're getting into this fall swing here it's about to get hectic uh fishing wise it seems like for me anyway i have the springs really busy and then as we get towards the end of summer it seems to ramp up again um for me but i'm curious you're out of south carolina there uh it's got to be hot and it's got to be probably pretty tough fishing this time of the year or are there are there still good bites to be had uh, it's pretty tough here <laughs> i live nearby lake wiley mm -hmm. and lake wiley is not going through a good moment. Well, first, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. The opportunity to be here with you guys. I really like the podcast, the shows that you guys do. I think you guys have a unique approach showing the other aspects of the the business of the fishing world. And I wish I wish I, wish I had access to you guys earlier, years <laughs> earlier when I started, because you guys are putting out su super valuable information. But anyway. Yeah, Wiley is really tough right now, man. Wiley's not being uh, fishing as good as he's used to. Uh -huh. uh, probably five, six years ago, we start to see more spotted bass on Wiley. It used to be basically a largemouth bass lake. Okay. And we don't know exactly how the spotted bass came here. Some people say that some people brought it from Norman. Other people say that they mm -hmm. just came through the flow. I don't know. Sure. Anyway, but change it a lot. Wiley used to be a lake that used to be fairly easy to catch a five pounder yeah and they're still there but they are becoming more difficult and the spotted bass is changing everything so right now if you go fishing while in on a day tournament and you have 13 14 pounds you're doing pretty well okay. Uh, okay on the other hand norman is doing really good norman is getting better and better every year uh uh we do bass in norman right yes yeah, spotted but the largemouth bass population of Norman is really showing up lately. Really? Okay. Yeah, which which we we had uh Berkeley, uh the big bet not Berkeley. Uh, Oakley? Oakley. Oakley the big I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And man, they had 40 some fish over five pounds if I'm not mistaken. So oh my a, gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it, it's showing up a little bit better. Is 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 becoming a better lake, I believe. And Norman is big, so handles better the fishing pressure. Yeah. I guess also the COVID thing and so many, there's a lot more people fishing seems to me. Yeah, at least. yeah I agree. And uh, the pressure on Wiley being a smaller lake, it really hurt the lake, you know. Gotcha. Uh, um, Norman being a bigger body of water, I think can handle it better. Yeah. So, but I really have a heart for Santi Cooper. I Santa. every time that I can. Oh my gosh! And how it's far? Like, how far of a drive? How from? How far from Wiley to Santi Cooper is it? Uh, from my house, uh, uh, from Wiley, I would say three hours. From my house, I would say two and two and a two and two two hours forty five minutes, maybe. Okay. 
Okay. You gotcha. know, and uh, but but Santi Cooper for me reminds me a lot of fishing back home, fishing. I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah. I, because that's that was my thought process too. I mean, you see the shots from Bassmaster and and all these tournament organizations when they are on Santi Cooper, and it just looks incredible to me. Um, but it kind of looks like some of the the media that you see from the peacock bass fishing in Brazil. And uh, I mean, that's a good segue. Let's get into to that. I mean, you, you can hear the the awesome Brazilian accent here. First of all, your English is fantastic. Um, <laughs> sure. but, but but I would love to hear a little bit about your background and what kind of really brought you to the U.S. But what what is it like catching peacocks in Brazil? <sighs> it's it's unique it's special it's a special yeah yeah uh, peacock bears is a different fish than bears of course but they have a lot of similarities mm -hmm. they, they can be really aggressive like bears they can be really finicky also like bears yeah they are not like that lion fish all the time they are not super aggressive all the okay. time okay they uh we don't have precise uh studies on it but we believe that uh uh, peacock bass can live up to 15 years oh wow yeah we have actually in the country you have 17 species you guys always see the great big one that is the asu one okay the one that i have here in my back yeah that's the one that grows larger okay and uh so this is the one that usually americans see but we have other species like the blue one which is a beautiful fish does not grow as much but it's like a 10 12 pound fish a large mm -hmm. one a yeah. big one. one, super fun. And they are very similar to bass sometimes. Uh, the peacock bass fishing is different. The season for the great peacock bass, for the Asu one, the big one, yeah. it's only, it's around about three months a year. Okay. You know, some lodges will tell you, eh, four months, five months, but not for real. The, the, the real deal, the juice is three months a year is when the waters are coming out of the jungle. Okay. And the rivers are coming back to their normal uh the fish has to come out of the jungle and they go to the rivers or to the lagoons by the rivers and they come to spawn also. But okay, in different than bears, they are very territorial fish. Uh, peacock bears, we believe that a big fish, he will live and die in one area. Oh, wow. Migrate as much as a largemouth bass. They go to the main river when they are younger, mm -hmm. but whenever they get bigger and bigger, they start, they, 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 they become more resident fish. And this is not a, not from studies because unfortunately Brazil does not do not have a lot of studies. It's from our experience on it. I guided for peacock bass. I guided in Brazil for 13 years. Wow. I started to guide when I was 22 out of the passion of fishing for fishing. I always love fishing. Very cool. And, and were, the, were your clients all around the world that would come to, to catch peacock bass? Or w what was your client base? A lot of U.S., a lot of Canada? What, what kind of folks? 50% probably U.S. Okay, okay. Then we had some people from Europe. Uh, few, not, not a lot of English from Canada. Mm. A few English from, from Europe. A lot, probably half of the English from Brazil. Okay. And I used to guide three months in the Amazon rainforest for peacock bass. Three, three and a half according to the season. Okay. And then I would go back to south of Brazil where I was a saltwater guide. Oh, wow. Yes. yes. Living the guide life. Wow. That yeah. is awesome. And, and yeah. then you, you kind of made some connections through that. We were talking off air. But, uh, you know, what kind of got you into, I mean, guiding and then now the industry side of things? What, how did you get into that side of the, of the fishing world? Uh, guiding was almost like a... My only way out, I could not work on an office. My father was a businessman. Mm -hmm. I had a hard time. I tried my best for that, but I was always fishing. And I guess it's his fault because he and you know, my mother taught me how to fish when I was really young. <laughs> there you go. Blame it on I, I grew up by the river. So, yeah. so for me, it became such a passion that I had to guide. For me, it was the only way out to, to really to, to do something where I could find real life. Yeah, you so, enjoyed it. Yeah. And when I started guiding in Brazil, guiding was very was a new was a new possibility in Brazil. There were not many guides. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started, my father said, "Well, man, you're going to starve to death." <laughs> and for sure, in the beginning, I almost did it. But yeah. thanks God, things start to line up, and 
we build a good reputation with the customers, good client base. So guiding became for me uh, my my way of life. And when I moved to America, I moved to work in the industry, in the fishing industry. I was already doing consulting, but okay. my main goal was to try to to establish a guide service I here in the U in the U.S. Yes, I couldn't I couldn't do it because we moved to America. We built our house here. First, we had an uh, offer to be working in Florida, uh, in Miami, Florida. I spent uh, three months in Miami. Okay. And I love Miami, but it was good enough for me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. kind of a country country boy and could not do well in that. Yeah. Mississippi. Yeah. So we end up moving to Fort Mill, South Carolina. Uh -huh. the time, Daiwa used to have a distributor distribution facility here. Okay. For the, for the East Coast. And I was working uh, with a Daiwa distributor in South America, working very closely with Daiwa doing product development. Mm. So we ended up here and we fell in love for the place, made good friends here. And here we are to today. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. And, and and so really the next part of your story, I mean, you've gone through this industry stuff. When you, when you moved here um, and the, my question to you, because you went on tour fishing the Bassmaster Elite Series as a co-angler. Before moving to America, did you know what tournament bass fishing was? Were you aware of the Elite Series? Or, or probably before then, it may be not have quite have been the Elite Series. But, I mean, was that all on your radar from the beginning? Was tournament bass fishing? Yes. Uh, uh, that was a dream. Uh, in, in 1985, we start to have some shows uh for the best master okay in brazil uh Very cool. vision was catching up in brazil and and we we start to have a few shows you know far in between if if i'm not mistaken in 2000 yeah we start to have the the whole season and for me was a uh how do you call how do you say in english uh Changing moment, you know, uh -huh. uh, because I saw uh, uh, Wood Davis winning the 2000, uh -huh. 2000 Best Master Classic. And that really, we were amazed by the show, by all the media, the tournament itself. The, prof the, the This is a dream. The level, yeah. yeah. The, the level of, prof how do you say, professional that you guys had. Yeah. So we fell in love for it. In 2004, Takahiro Mori won a Best Master Classic here on Lake Wiley. Mm -hmm. And when we had an option to move to South Carolina to work here, uh, I went to the map and started to look for lakes. And I saw Lake Wiley. I said, oh, Mary and my wife, Takahiro Mori won on Lake Wiley. We have to go. We gotta go. It's, I know the link. <laughs> that is that is so cool to me. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that's when when folks, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like in this industry, there's some negative talk around, like, oh, bass fishing is never is never gonna be uh, obviously like a golf or uh, uh, some of these high paying professional sports. But to see that passion and you see it from from out of country anglers that are. Or when you're looking to move here, you're looking at a lake that you saw on a tournament. Yes. And, and that is that is incredible to me. I mean, I think of places, same deal. Um, I look at places around the country based on where lakes are from watching yes. events. So that is that is really cool, though. Even out of country, you were like, we got to go there. There was a pro, mm -hmm. a Bassmaster Classic there. Yeah, and, and crazy thing. So when I came to America, I came to work with product development, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, I need to learn the best fishing market. We have, we do have largemouth bass in Brazil. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, we brought largemouth bass in 1967. At okay. least this is the official report. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if somebody brought earlier, but some American engineers that came to work with the Brazilian government to help build uh, hydroelectric power oh, wow. reservoirs, uh, they were avid best fishermen <laughs> like we gotta we gotta have something to do when we're not working exactly they were building these reservoirs in the south and in the south we we don't have as much peacock bass so all men made reservoirs and they brought the largemouth bass we have only the northern bass the pure blood northern bass in brazil 
Okay. So my f- first contact with largemouth bears, I was 16 years old, and we heard that nearby our city there was a there's a power plant, and somebody said, "Oh, they are catching some green fish over there. They look like a trout, but has a larger mouth and this and that." And we go like, "Man, maybe bears, you know?" So we went over there, me and my friend of mine, with a John boat for HP. Yeah. <laughs> Little John, mercury. everyone, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah that's a little awesome. mercury, a four yeah. HP mercury, and we caught the whole day, man. We caught one, and when we caught that fish, when I caught that fish, I'll be honest with you, brother, my life changed. Wow. Yeah, the 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 look of that fish, the even the smell of the large mouth. <laughs> yeah, the smell yeah, for me was was unique. And then God is so amazing. God, I believe in God a lot, so I don't yeah. mind. I don't. Yeah. I hope you guys don't mind me mentioning, but. Yeah. God, in his good sense of humor, gave me the opportunity of coming work here and on his grace. And, and uh, I fished the, for, the three first years that I was in America on the Elite Series as a co-angler. Mm-hmm. I met Todd Otten here in the Carolinas, the professional, the angler Todd Otten. Yeah, oh, yeah. We became good friends and he was fishing the Elites by the time. So I was going, uh, traveling with him as an own boater and learning all, the, all of this having this amazing experience as far as fishing. And then I had, I, I, got, I got to fish twice with Takahiro Mori, the guy that I saw on television. I got to meet many of the pros that I thought, my gosh, I'll never be able to, to even, you know, got to talk with these people. They were you're around. Yeah. You're the people you have been uh, idolizing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and but that, that, that was a super cool experience, man. I learned a lot. I wish, I know that the anglers like it better without co-anglers, and yeah. I understand. I, I understand the reasons. I, I can see that. Yeah, I, I did fish some opens as a, an angler too, but the co-angler uh, deal for me, for the sport especially, is an amazing deal, because as a co-angler you can learn. You, you can learn a lot really fast, and yeah. if you see the investment is a fraction of the investment that an angler has to oh, do. Yeah. So That's the co-angler it. side of the business, I know that hurts sometimes the anglers and it's not comfortable all the time to have another guy trying. He's not competing against you, but he's trying to catch the fish in the same same water that you're fishing. But still, it's a it's a cool deal. I think I that's well that's well said. I mean, to me, so so um, I I fished a Toyota series, which I consider kind of AAA, similar to the Bassmaster Opens. It's around on the boater side at $1,800 entry fee, kind of the thing. Um, so I fi- I went and fished those last year and then put pen and paper to numbers and as business from the Bass Boat, kind of looked at the numbers and said, okay, well, I, I don't know if I'm ready to do that again. Um, you know, I cashed one check out of three tournaments and it was like, I spent a ton of money, spent a ton of time. Uh and so I looked at it this year on the co-angler side, and I really do wish that uh, the FLW Tour still had an entire, you know, now Major League Fishing, but had a full season for co-anglers from that perspective. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I, like you said, I understand. I see both sides. I fish as a boater in a lot of tournaments and I and, and team tournaments and things where I would be like, you know, I, I see the, the negative side of it. But from a learning at a fraction of the cost, being around guys who know, incredibly well what they're doing on the on the pro fishing side of things um was huge and so to me the only way to do that now is to fish you know a couple of divisions of the opens or the toyota series as a as a co-angler to get that same experience um so that's that's the way to do it now but i i I don't know i agree with you from that perspective is i think that uh there's there's both sides to it but from a up-and-coming angler um, it definitely does does make it harder from from somebody. You're just going to have to do it with the smaller tournament series, not the full Bassmaster Elite Series Major League yes. Fishing Tour. So, yes, I understand. I agree with you. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so now we're in the U.S. You're fishing the Elite Series. You're connecting with guys. You, you're good friends with Todd Otten. Where did Waterwood come into this whole thing? Well, as I said, I started guiding. Let me go back a little bit. I started guiding uh, when I was 22. Got some connections with the distributors over there. Started to work for the industry, right? Yeah. Came to America. Always had a passion for fishing tackle. Start to buy as much as I could. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> my wife was not really happy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another another side. Another that's not, you can see all your boxes yeah. on the rise. For those yeah, of you watching, yeah. well, I, can, I cannot I cannot complain. She supports me as much as as she can. So I, I have the best on that side. I have the best. But anyway, so we always buying baits, trying to change baits. Always had the idea that. There's always a way to do something better. Yeah. Not that we are better or that we know better, but there's always a way to make something better. And this is how you see the industry developing and evolving. So Todd Otten is a Zoom man. He's sponsored by Zoom. Mm -hmm. Through Todd, I got in touch with the Eddie Chambers, the Wood Baits. They call it the WEC. Okay. And the, we call it Zoom Crankbaits or Zoom Baits. And uh, got in touch with those baits. I always love wood baits because of Brazil. Uh, so I really start to fish wood baits. I really like wood baits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about six years or so ago, unfortunately, Mr. Chambers passed away. Mm -hmm. So we kind of lost access to his baits. The baits went market, went sky high for the baits. Price on the baits went sky high. People that collect baits, they were buying them mostly to collect, not to fish. Yeah, yeah. So out of the necessity, out of the passion, I had already, we were already making baits in Brazil for peacock bass okay. since 2012. We found this amazing wood that grows on the rainforest. It's called Marupá, very similar to balsa, about 30% more dense than balsa. Heavier, heavier than balsa is. 30%, a third, but a lot stronger than balsa, has longer fiber it's unique really unique wood and we were making baits for peacock bears out of that wood in brazil so when, when answering your question when mr chambers unfortunately passed uh i said you know i'm going to start to make a few crankbaits for myself because i'm not going to use the ones that i have from him you know i cannot get it anymore and for me it's history it's not only it's a collection deal you know, too yeah, yeah especially yeah. someone like that passes like that that yeah. is uh, you want to have that as a keepsake yeah, so I made a few baits and brought to the U.S. and gave a few to Todd and to other friends that fish here. You know, there's a lot of pros here in our area. Mm -hmm. And got it. I mean, everybody came back to me, man, I need more. you got to make more. <laughs> and that brought us the idea for Waterwood. And we started Waterwood about four, almost five years ago. Okay. And it's been wild ride uh, we were not expecting the the welcome that we we found in the in the in the fishing community you know our baits are different have a higher cost because the process that we use to build the baits and materials but it's been an amazing ride and now after almost four years of being really in the market learning more and and understanding better the anglers we are being able to develop new baits that we believe are better than the ones that we, when we started. So it's been a, a work in progress. It's a process. We are not quite there yet. We have a lot to learn. We learn every day. I always tell all my friends and my customers, you know, every batch of water wood, it's a little bit different mm -hmm. because in every batch of baits, we learn, we learn about the wood. We learn about the process. We learn about the fishing. We try to get, as I said before, the concepts that are more established complex con concepts like a like a round body bait, like a E1 or a Bagley that used to be the B1. Yeah, yeah. Or a big O even previous to that. And we try to, to see where we can change something or how to improve that bait. And because I, I like that concept. I mean, as far as finding, you know. Um, not you find a bait that's good that it catches them, you know, it catches them, and you say, Okay, how do I make this even better? How do I yes. put my twist on it with water wood? Which I, I love the name water wood because it's literally the wood coming from the rainforest. It's yes. it. and, and I was doing some research too, just on the wood. I believe it's um, has an oil or something related to, to yes. uh, water repellency, right? Because it's always in the water, yes, exactly. Yeah. Instead of absorbing water like balsa or cedar, yeah, yeah. 
uh, the marupa, the wood that we use, has more oil, as you mentioned, so it expels water. And it, so our baits, even if you remove the paint, if, if you fish long enough that you can, you know, get to remove the paint out, out of the bait, sure. uh, it, the bait still will be a functional bait. Of wow. course, with yeah. in a longer time, you know, longer period of time, the wood, every wood will, will flood. Sure. But our wood, is, it takes a lot longer and, and being stronger, uh, uh, one of the frustrations that I had, and I guess a lot of fishermen had with wood baits, yeah. that they are amazing. They are fishing machines. They catch fish. Mm -hmm. But on the same hand, they are very fragile. You break you know, them all the time. You, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you there as far as uh, traditional balsa wood baits. Love them. Like you said, fish catchers. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I have broken a lot of them, <laughs> a yes. lot, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and and you know, fish bite it, hook perforates the paint paint job, wood will flood with time, and the bait will be, you know, we, we'll lose efficiency. So when we built water, would my goal is to make a bait, a wood bait for bass fishing that would have the same strength that we have in our peacock bass baits yeah we were bringing peacock bass baits to from america to brazil great brands great product mm -hmm. uh, but they were made out of certain woods that you catch two or three peacock bass and as the fish hit the bait the hook hangers move they, they you know and then you have a gap water starts to flood the bait sure so a really expensive bait in brazil I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, diminishing any product. Sure, sure. Yeah. But you, you buy this amazing bait and you catch two or three fish. Next day, the bait is not working properly anymore because it's flooded. Yeah, absolutely. So when we brought Waterwood to America, when we started Waterwood, the, the baits for America, I said, we got to figure out a way to make a bait for bass fishing that has the the benefits of the wood bait, natural, um, uh, natural material, organic material, mm -hmm. but that can hold better. And of course, nothing is indestructible. You know, we are fishermen. We we manage to break almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of course. But uh, uh, our baits really hold. We want to believe that they really hold a lot better than balsa. And a traditional balsa. So in, in just finalizing. Uh, uh, your question, uh, the answer to your question, uh, uh, the concept that we have, if you go back when Eddie Chambers was, was building his baits, he was building the mud, the hickey, the flat sides, mm -hmm. very similar today what you have like a Berkeley Fritz side, but they were made out of wood. Your traditional flat sides, the original yeah. flat sides, yeah. yeah. By the time those baits, they were the cutting edge uh, design. And they were being built with the best available materials for that time. Everything today is different. We have access to different, different components, different materials. And the design on the baits, if you look at the design on the baits, they are always evolving. You, you look at Megabass, they are always, like the 110, they are always coming up with a new version, a new twist. On Alert. Them. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's always room to improve. And this is what we are trying to do in our wood baits. Uh, that being said, uh, we have a one. I don't know if it's a hindrance, but it's a characteristic of water wood of what we do. Yeah, our baits. We we try to build really tournament baits, baits that will really give the angler an edge, an advantage. Uh, yeah, and, and you know that. For that instance, you can go. Let's say to a good tackle store. You can go to Omina Fish. And you will find swimming baits that are very low cost mm -hmm. and swimming baits that are more costly, higher cost. Oh, yeah. They are. They may look similar, but there's a big difference. I agree. In, in, in the performance of the bait. So we try to do exactly the same uh, with water wood. How can we offer the customer, the angler, a, a tournament bait that will be really, that will really bring some, some advantage that will really give the, the angler the edge. You, you're, you're tournament fishing fisherman, you know, a couple of bites in the end of the day, they may not mean much. They mean, they mean the, the difference in winning or not. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. A, a couple of bites. I mean, it's tournament fishing to me, the more and more I do it, 
uh, is an odds and a numbers situation. And the more bites that you get in a day, the increasing your odds are, the more chances you have that it's a five pounder yeah. instead of a two pounder. Yeah. So I, yes. I agree. Bites are, are important. Yes, exactly. I like it. Well, um, I want to dig into a couple of things uh, about the baits specifically. Uh, first of all, the paint jobs are, are magnificent. I was just on a podcast um, last night uh, with Hellabass had me on to talk about iCast. I was at iCast this year and uh, we were talking, going through the baits and he's like, oh, what are these Waterwood deals? And, and I was like, I, I'm, we're actually having on Business from the Bass Boat, we're, our next show is going to be uh, the founder of Waterwood Custom Baits. So uh, we talked through it on on the iCast release, but um, you know, it looks like some of the new stuff for this year. You've kind of gone also not just you know traditional when you think of wood baits. I'm thinking of uh, crank baits for the most part, and then you kind of you go into these other other realms. But you guys are coming out with spooks or spook style baits, top water baits, hoppers, mm -hmm. wake baits. I mean very in-depth this isn't just a single flat side kind of a situation uh company but with with that you know how how does the wood act on top water stuff the wood is, is, is i have to be very prudent here okay. i believe that the wood is better than balsa for top water baits mm -hmm. Because one of the challenges of making a balsa bait, balsa has a very short fiber. And when you're making a long body bait, yeah, that bait becomes very brittle. Oh, that makes sense because you're just you're, you don't have long connections the whole way out. Okay. Exactly. This is why it's not very common for you to see long baits like jerk baits or, or top waters make of, out of balsa. Yeah. It can be done, and there's some people that do a great job on it, but they are not as resilient as uh, other woods. And, and this is where our wood really shine because the longer fiber makes a, a lot a lot stronger bait. To give you an idea, uh, the wood that we use water, the, the Marupa, the water wood, is, is being used today by the Germans to build uh, gliders, competition gliders. Really? Yeah, like two, $3 million planes. Because the wood is super light, it's very light, but super resistant. Mm. And, and even though we have great materials like carbon, like magnesium, other materials that people are using for, for these kind of applications. Man-made materials. Yes, yes. Yeah. The, 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 the wood is still unique. Uh, so as far as the resistance, as far as the, the new baits, the, the top water baits, if I may show you here. Yeah, I go have, for it. For those of you on MP3, yeah. you'll have to tune into YouTube to see it. But. Yeah, this is this is brand new in the market, just released. It's a, what we call a smooth criminal. Like smooth the, criminal. I yeah, like it. Yeah. And we gave the name because it's very smooth in the water. It has a very natural glide in the water. Okay. You know, when you're working a plastic bait, like a spook, you can see that the bait does not only glide, but the bait kind of jerks a little bit. Because sure. the way that... Kind of choppy. Plastic, yes. Plastic plastic reacts to water the flotation on the plastic and if you throw this bait you're going to notice that it's very it's a lot more natural uh, another factor that helped us to develop the top water baits was believe it or not covid really yes covid for the industry was a i believe a blessing in one side if you can have something good coming out of such bad disease but on a way COVID put a lot more people on the water. I agree. Being not, not being able to socialize as much and being, I guess, the pressure of the system, the pressure of the disease, the unknown of mm -hmm. this new new factor. A lot of people start to relate more with, with nature and fishing more and spending more time on the water. So if you talk with people in the industry, like you have Rick Pierce and other people in the industry, my partner that yeah. runs a boat dealer, uh, uh, the, the sales on boats and everything else went through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so a lot more people on the lake, and that's the the good part of it. If if the, if we can call like that, if we can say that was something good out of it, yeah. Then, but it that came with a byproduct: a lot more people on the water, a lot more pressure mm -hmm. on the fishing. Absolutely. And 
bass, I learned that bass is very similar to a peacock bass. Okay. Uh, studying the bass, they say that in natural environment, a largemouth bass, a northern bass, can live up to average 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. And in perfect conditions, control conditions, maybe even 15 years old. A fish that has that age, they are a living creature. They learn. Oh, yeah. And, and the pressure on the lake, on my opinion, changed the fish. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're fishing, let's say, let me use a bait here. Let's say the whopper plopper. Mm -hmm. When the whopper plopper came about, for me, it was a magic bait. Oh, my gosh. It, like when it that. first broke, it was, I, I'm in the, I, exactly. I fished a tournament in Oklahoma on 10 killer and it was bananas. I mean, it was yes. ridiculous. They were, they were jumping over each other to eat that thing. Yeah. 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 And exactly the same here, man. We we were going to the lake and go like, my gosh, this is. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> the best thing ever, right? Yeah. So we buy every one and every color and every size and all the variants, right? Uh -huh. And today you go fishing with that bait. You, you still catch fish, but they. It's tougher. It's tougher, and they blow on it. They don't take it. They 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 follow it a lot, and and because, in my opinion, a fish, as a living creature, learns. I always use the the analogy of a dog. If you have a dog in your house, and if you come, you're arriving from, you know, from your day, working day, arriving to your house, stop, stop in front of your driveway, honk the horn, your dog come wagging his tail, you go over there, you pet him, you receive him really well. Next next week, whenever he hears your truck arriving, even if it's in the corner, if he can hear it, he will be ready to go. He's there already wagging his tail and wait, waiting on you. Mm -hmm. But if you do the contrary, whenever you arrive in your home, your dog come to you, you kick the dog. Yeah. Third time that he does that, he will hear, he will listen to the noise of your truck arriving. He's, he's going like, I'm out of here. Yeah. There's a bad experience coming. And fishing for me is pretty much like that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 peacock bears, as they live in one area for a long period of time, it's very interesting. You go with customers and everybody wants to throw a prop bait, a big prop bait. Yeah, the, what, the, the, what you see on TV, right? The yes, exactly. big peacock bass eating a top water. Yeah. Yeah, so I want, I want that experience. And they throw, throw that top water and they go like, oh, there's nothing here. You, you throw over there a one-ounce swim jig in the right color, swim that thing, you know, five, six inches underneath the, 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 the surface Surf. of the water. Yeah. And all of a sudden, man, that rod is going like boom. Uh-huh. And they go like, my gosh. The fish was there all the time, but he got conditioned to that bait. He learned that that bait is, is, is not a good experience. Of course, they are aggressive, they have an instinct, and they react to bait, and they still bite that bait occasionally. Sure. But if you look on, on the numbers and the consistency, they learn that bait. And so for Waterwood, when we start to do crankbaits, we did crankbaits out, out of the tradition of, of crankbaits and out of the idea of offering a better crankbait to the customer that would la last longer. Mm -hmm. But with COVID, the fishing pressure, we learned that when you make a wood bait, First, you have a, a bait that has a different frequency in the water. Sure. Uh, it's a natural material. It's organic material. So it's a lot more natural in the water, mm. right? Different yeah. than plastic. Uh, second thing is very, it's, it's, it's a different noise in the water. Sure. This is I one of the reasons why we, we don't put rattles in our baits. And people go like, oh, I wish you guys would put rattles in our ba in your baits. Yeah. I think if you do, we can do that, no problem. And there is an application for that, no doubt. There, sure. there are situations that a rattle bait is a better bait. But looking at the times that we are living, especially when you're talking about competition, especially where, when you're talking about catching fish that is a lot of, under, under a lot of fishing pressure, a wood top water gives you, in my opinion, an edge over everybody else on the field. Probably there's, 90 other guys fishing a top water bait, a plastic top water bait. Yeah. And if you're throwing a wood bait, you're offering to the fish the same pattern, but on a, a lot more appealing approach. 
And for us, on, on, our, on our minds, that gives the tournament angler an edge. Mm -hmm. So this is why nice we much. migrated to top water. I see. I see. Very cool. No, I think those are some really good points. Um, I, I think about especially and just cranking too. I mean, your typical pre-spawn um, Grand Lake situation, right? Where those fish yeah. are seeing so many crankbaits go by their head. Um, to me, that's where the advantage is. And I really like that you're bringing this. Um, sometimes, sometimes I think in the custom tackle world, and this is just a personal opinion on my side of things. Sometimes I feel like it is targeted and there's a very much a need for this, but, but to bait collectors and folks who are interested in a super, uh, interesting technique for me being a tournament angler first, I want it to give me an advantage. Right. That, yes. and that, that is what I really like about your approach is this is not just a, a very well handcrafted artisanal style bait, but it's also the advantage side of it. So um, now that's to me, that's that's the best approach that you can have is that it's it's not just um, something that looks really good and catches fish. It's we're here to make it a better situation for tournament guys. Yes, and, and that's very interesting. We have a good friend that he's a genius marketing guy. Mm -hmm. he, he used to do marketing for several big brands and especially foreigner brands. Yeah. And one day we were having lunchtime and I was picking his brains about water wood, uh, if, what would be the best approach to the market, this and that. And he said, why are you building these baits? So oh, I'm building because I want a stronger bait or a wood bait that lasts longer. He said, no, no, but why are you building this? So, well, to win tournaments. Then he said, there you go, built to win. There you go. built, so this, And that's on the side of every box, right? As yeah, far as this, why, this, this became our, our I'll go. say our code, you know. We, we, we try to build baits for tournament anglers that really want to win. And it, it, it is an interesting deal. We see guys with $100,000 bass boat, you know, three units up in front, two units. <laughs> on the Bass coast. fishermen are crazy. It's a, yeah. it's a problem that we have. So they have $100,000, $100,000 investment right there. And then on the same time, they go like, ah, I'm not sure about the $38. <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you're dead on. It is hilarious to me. I think about that all the time. I mean, we talk about it on shows that we've had talking about batteries, right? With X2 power and wiring it's, we spend yeah. ridiculous amounts of money on this game, but then there's little components, you know, I, you see guys with hundred thousand dollar boats that are, that are using, um, you know, the cheapest line that they can find the cheapest yeah. rods, you know, and, and, and baits. And it's just like, there's, it's just, it's a funny conception or misconception to me on, on some of this stuff that there's, there's value in those high quality products. Um, I've always believed that. And it's also what you get confidence in, you know, if I catch yes. them on a, on a mega bass jerk bait, it's hard for me to go try something else. Like I know it's going to work uh, for I me. I agree with you. I you know, my gosh, the same here, exactly the same. Uh, uh, the bait is what connects you to the fish. Mm -hmm. This is what the fish is biting. Mm -hmm. After, first, you have to make it bite. Then you are concerned about your line, concerned about your reel, your rod. But the first thing, your first connection. Got to get a bite first, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so that's that's the interesting side of the, the 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 market because a lot of anglers they do not understand the value of certain items. Like a battery, you can have, you name it, best, best boat ever. Yeah. Best engine, trolling motor. If your batteries fail on you, brother, you're done. You're totally. <laughs> I don't care what boat you're in. You're not getting back. <laughs> it's over. Yeah. You know, tournament day, it, it becomes an excuse, you know. Oh, oh yeah. my battery died. How many times do you hear that? Oh, oh I was on fish and my battery died and I couldn't. <laughs> uh -huh. So th 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 that's an interesting side of the, I guess it's human nature, you know, this is us, this is what, how we are wired and, and but it's an interesting side of the business. Yeah, no doubt. Well, one thing I wanted to do here, uh, let's see if I can bring in, um, on your, your website, there's just some incredible photos of these, of these baits. Uh, let's see here, share. Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to bring in just your, your boat photos or your bait photos here. 
So the for those of you who are on iTunes, I apologize. This is this is going to be just the YouTube kind of side of things. But these are incredible custom custom paint jobs uh, on these as well. I mean, we talk about the wood as much as we have and the the benefits there. But the photo gallery that you guys have, it's just uh, so professional and, and incredible baits. And like you said, that that price point being that it is a $38 bait, you know, that's kind of a, an interesting, like, oh my gosh, it's an expensive bait. But we had cast fishing on earlier this year. So that was, it's an Australian mm -hmm. company that has come to the U.S. And they've started to go into soft plastic realm too. But um, they're similar deal, wood top waters for the most part bringing that salt water into the freshwater space yeah. and that mindset. And, uh, it, you know, there's attention to detail there and durability factors. I think when you talk about these high end products, uh, that you don't get in other situations, I love the packaging, by the way. Um, I, it's very, uh, unique. Mm -hmm. you know, one, one question I do have for you, Marcus is, uh, are you, especially with Lake Norman being the red crest, are you going to be at the red crest, uh, uh, expo. Yes, yeah, we, 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 we are, we are aiming for that. Of course, it's our, our, uh, one of our home lakes here. So we are, and I think we'll be a super event. I think we'll be a blessing for the Carolinas mm -hmm. as far as the, for the, uh, the sport development here on the Carolinas. We have a lot of good fishermen in the area, as you know. Uh, uh so, uh, I think we'll be, amazing we, we're going to be there for sure actually we are trying to prepare some products especially for the for the event oh okay little nuances special colors special stuff to mark the event because it's such a unique opportunity and a privilege for the carolinas to have this tournament here so yes i, I hope we will we'll be there it's at least it's, this is our goal yeah now one question on i've been noticing on a couple of these baits this kind of center eye What's what's the thought process around around that? Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, you promised that you're not gonna tell this anybody. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we when we build a crankbait, we put that dot in the middle of the crankbait, and not in every crankbait, only in the shad or sunfish or or, or bluegill patterns. Ah, uh -huh, there's another one there. If you get a crankbait like this, uh, mm -hmm. crawfish pattern, you will notice that I don't have that. Yep, yep, there's no eye there. Uh, for, a, for a bait fish pattern, first, the dot in the middle give the fish a kill spot, help the fish. Target. The, the predators, they, they, they mark the target by the eye. Mm -hmm. So this is why they always try to hit the bait in the eye, in the head. Well, how many times have you caught a fish on a swim bait and they, uh, for, you know, eat exactly head first? Yeah, yeah, great point, Aiden. Exactly like that. This is why. So the cues, the, the dot helps, works as a cue spot, but the dot here on a, on a, not on this bait, but on a regular crankbait as a bluegill pattern or a shed pattern. When you remove material from the sides of the crankbait, right? Yeah. And you add weight on the side. That bait has a gravitational center, is weighted on the belly, has sure. the hooks. So that bait is always sitting like that and has the tendency to run straight like that. If everything's fine, that bait will run like an arrow. People say, I want, I like baits that run, hunt. And that's sure. just weight, weight positioning in the bait and, and the design of the weight inside of the bait. But how many times, Aidan, you're cranking that bait, being a deep deep diver or being a shallow diver, you're, you're cranking that bait, you're going to rip wrap, and you feel fish's lap on the bait. Oh, yeah, all the time. They, they hit it because they are reacting to the bait, but they are not really sure. My interpretation of that, they are not really sure. They are reacting. They are kind of studying the prey. They don't have hands, so they slap at it or bite. <laughs> yeah, so, they're just... Whenever, it, yeah. whenever we add weight Aiden, to the sides of the bait, that bait is a lot more unstable. Mm -hmm. So you're cranking and you have a fish to slap on the bait. And you usually what you do is stop, you do something with your rod, you, you twitch your rod a little bit, trying to give a bait a little bit more, more erratic action, trying to make that fish to react to the bait. 
Sure. When you put weight on the sides, when you do, when you jerk the rod, when you twitch the rod after that slap, instead of the bait in doing this, that bait will do like a Z. wide wobbles. Okay. Okay. Exactly. And that, it's very hard for the fish. It goes like, went to one side, came back to the other. I have to get it. Yeah. You know, this is how they react to it. Every time that that bait is, is they have the feeling that that bait is getting out of the reach, is, is, is being able to escape them. They react to it. And as we said, they don't have hands, so they, they grab with their mouth. So the, the Q dot is, is a twofold, is, is to help the fish to mark the, the, the bait, and that, that's a kind of a byproduct. Mm -hmm. But the main reason that we use a Q dot on, on shed patterns uh, uh, and bluegill patterns is to add action, erratic action to that bait when you twitch the rod. We don't do that on the crawfish patterns because sure. the crawfish patterns we don't want the bait to i don't want that bait to have this erratic action when it's in touch with the bottom i want that bait track in front of that fish as long as it can to that fish every time that that bait hit the rock and change directions this is when the fish will react to it and mm -hmm. if the bait is too erratic especially in cold water predators they they kind of they have a natural natural ability mm -hmm. to understand the prey and almost like they did uh almost like they do, they do some evaluation well i'm in, in my met metabolism is very low i'm on saving saving energy mode mm -hmm. and that bait comes to me so erratic so fast that you know what something I'm not, I'm not chasing is out yeah. of my reach yeah whenever they have a low metabolism, right? Whenever they have a high metabolism, the faster, better they react. This is why when we are fishing jerk bait on winter time, majority of the bites come when we stop the bait. Mm -hmm. The bait stop is like a dying shed and the, the predator is, has a program, a men, I would say, I don't know how to say be better than this, like a mental pro program sure. to react that way to that bait. And they come in and, and bite it. And you see your line jump in, you have a jerkbait bite. Uh, if that jerkbait goes too fast, that fish will not react to the bait. So we try to design our products to inside of what we believe is that program that fish has and how they hunt and how they feed. So it's much more than, it's so easy to make a, a like a top water bait. You know, but when you make like a, we have a popper, we call it, uh, uh, sugar daddy this is the popper here it's yeah a longer style popper mm -hmm. we designed this bait to to not only to to do the pop to to sugar and speed water but to walk mm. and you guys had uh had a guest on your show uh help me here uh, uh i believe it was andy that was interviewing him mm -hmm. uh, he's a genius fisherman he was talking about top water what's his name I'm trying to think of what show. How, how oh, long ago I believe was it? it? Hold on. I'll tell you right now. Uh, da -da -da, let me find here because I got his contact. Oh, nice. I asked Bailey for his contact because I was so impressive. Uh, impressive. His name is Tyler Berger. Oh, yeah. 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 And Tyler was talking about top waters, that different approach to top water. And he said, I use a walking popper as a frog. But on summertime, out of the grass, if you're fishing a lake that does not have that heavy grass cover, sure. that the, the, the popper is a better bait because first, it has two treble hooks. Catch your hookup ratio, yep. Yes. And second, if they are only slapping at the bait, you have a lot more chance to... to Get inside to, of their mouth. Exactly. Yeah. Than a frog. So I, I guess he's done a lot of study. He knows what he's talking about because... This is exactly how the fish react to the bait. If you only chug the bait, if you only pop, pop it, they, they follow, they look, they look, they look, they never take it. You know, but whenever you walk, whenever that bait is turning, almost like turning back and yeah. facing the fish, they go like, oh my gosh, what is that? I'm going to react to it. You know? <laughs> so, so that's very interesting. And I apologize for my English. I don't have the best words. No, you don't. Uh, it, but I hope I can. Oh, it's fantastic. I really think 
you've got great English. Um, but as far as uh, that, I've always loved that about top water fishing. It's my favorite way to catch fish. But when you're throwing a spook, when you're throwing that top water style bait, walking bait, same deal. I mean, to me, if it's not, if I'm not going really fast and just covering water with one, um, I like to have that bait almost turn 180, right? Like it is yeah. really looking back. And that's when I yes. seem to get my best bites is when it's, when it's doing that kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. So it's really cool in a popper format too. And, uh, to me, that's the, um, the best of both worlds and you can cover water with it and, and be, be going fast. And then if you do need to slow it down and do your chug and your pop, you can, you can catch them that way too. Yes. And of course we, we are very, uh, aware that, uh, there are situations where different actions, different, uh, speeds are much better. You know, like we, we, we have two walk, uh, waking baits. We have one that we call a speed waker, which is a short body bait. Yeah. Uh, extremely designed to be real, extremely fast. Mm -hmm. You can burn that bait and especially spotted bass. I don't know what it is about that fish, but they love speed. You know, the faster speed demons, you know, yeah, yeah exactly. You, you know, probably smallmouth bass, I believe. I don't have that much experience on smallmouth bass, but we've been talking with several anglers that do have that live up north, like you know, uh, 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 like uh, 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 Andy mm -hmm. and, and Bailey, both live up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we understand that speed can be a factor. High speed can be a good factor for smallmouth bass. Mm -hmm. So we have a bait that's called speed waker, trying to fit exactly that situation, that nice. application. We have another waking bait that is a longer bait that is designed to do exactly the contrary, to do slow water displacement as possible in a slow pace. That big largemouth, she's sitting nearby that cover. It's shallow. It's hot. She is not very comfortable. She's not feeling like I'm not chasing anything that's really flying by. But uh -huh. she sees that a lot of action, you know, is low in, over there. And she goes like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to take that. Easy like, yeah. it, right? So big shad going by. And yeah. what's it? And, and what's the, I know the speed waker. What's the, what's the other wake bait called? That's yeah. Slow. The other one we, we, we are about to, to launch it. It's first okay. year in the market next week. Oh, very and nice. It's called a joint week. Joint week. Okay. No, John week. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> I the got you. I got you. I like yeah, it. We, well, we like we we I really like the, the the movie. I really like the actor. And and when we were fishing that bait, uh, first the prototypes, we we had a friend of ours in the boat, and he is from Mexico, mm -hmm. and uh, he guides on eventually guides on Lake Falcon, and wow. he said, "Oh, that bait is like a assassino." Like a killer, a hitman, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I said, oh, Joe Wick is a good name. <laughs> there you go. I like so it. How, how it that's came up. Yeah. I love the names. That's that's fantastic. Um, yeah. No, I mean, and, and with 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 Waterwood Custom Baits, I mean, we were talking off air a little bit about you are in a lot of dealers locally and, in, and, and all around when it comes to uh, specific tackle shops and helps, in my opinion, it really helps those tackle shops keep going, uh, when you have a product that is unique and, um, hard to find production, not nearly as much, right. As a plastic bait. So, so that kind mm -hmm. of a thing, um, where can folks find waterwood custom baits? Can they order them online uh, or go to your local tackle shop? How does that work? Well, they cannot. We, we are not selling directly to the public at this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. We we wish we could, but we don't have enough production. You know, as demand is really high, and as I said before, surprising us the demand on the baits. Yeah. So we have several dealers that carry our baits, and if you go to our website, www.waterwoodcustombaits.com, you will see there's a icon on the top where, where to buy you can click on that item it will be all the stores that carry our baits officially and that have a website and phone number uh, we are working with a lot of new dealers uh, we try to 
our approach to the market, Aiden, is a little bit different. And when I was watching uh, the show that you recorded uh, with Ken Ma and Rick Pierce, other shows that you have, okay. I really learned a lot about the approach that is this people that like a accomplished angler like Ken Ma has to the to the industry and also approach that Hick Pierce has to the boat industry which is somewhat the fishing industry oh yeah uh, uh, we, we we are not trying to be everywhere as far as tackle stores yeah we, what we are trying to do we are trying to get tackle stores that especially the ones that have some real connection with the fishing world or that the owners are fishermen, anglers, that they have solid anglers working on the store. They have a good pro staff, solid pro staff, that are people that have, that they are proven anglers in certain areas. In that area. These are yeah. the stores that we like to work the, the best because then we know that we have people selling our product that are really able to explain our product and really able to put it to work, to harvest all the benefits that we try to put in our products, mm -hmm. you know, all this edge, because I have to be extremely careful here, prudent. I don't want to sound arrogant by far, not it. We are, as I said, we don't feel that we are better or we are doing something better. We just do the best as we can. Yeah. But I feel that, our baits is for those anglers that are, have a really passion for it. It's not that a guy that's just going to Walmart to buy a bait to fish, you know, for 30 minutes and whatever. Sure. Uh, we don't take water wood as a, as a fishing lure. Mm -hmm. We take water wood as a tool to give you an edge, you know, a tool. I like and, it. and whenever we have a dealer that have people with this, with the same mindset, you know, that's where we seem to, to, to do the best. That makes you know, sense. Yeah. Uh, of course, whenever a product has high demand, you have a lot of people trying to get it because they see a, a good way to do good profit and which is valuable. I understand. And I value that, but uh, our goal is to, to be in, in, in dealers that have a really, a real heart for the deal, you know, really a real heart for the sport. They are not only, looking numbers or money they are really numbers and money they become a byproduct it's like we build our baits mm -hmm. we could make it a lot cheaper and we'd be a lot more profitable yeah but that's that's then it's not our heart you do what you do because you have a heart for it you guys spend i don't know probably your biggest investment is your time oh my gosh yeah. a lot of time <laughs> like, on it. yeah yeah you got to the point that you went to your company and say, hey, guys, i rather work as an independent contractor mm -hmm. because I really have a heart for, for, for fishing. And yeah. I want to pursue that. I, this is why I think you guys are going to succeed, uh, be extremely successful, because if you look at every big company, when they start, they have somebody with a heart for, for something. And you guys do have. And this is exactly the same approach that we have for Waterwood. So you yeah. see, answering your question, we don't have a lot of dealers, but we have some dealers. We have other dealers that they do not even want us to advertise as far as uh, net uh, uh, web sales mm -hmm. because they like Waterwood to be on their shelves, on their store to bring customers to, to the store. Because usually, angler, you know, your fisherman, your angler, you go to a store, very hard for you to buy only one item. <laughs> oh, yeah. You buy what you went to buy, and then you see, oh, this is new, I need that. You know what? I'm going to get a little bit more of that. And, you know, and, and this is something else that we do on Waterwood, let me tell you. We have a special on Waterwood. If you buy Waterwood, and for 50 cents more, we will give you a fake uh, invoice okay, uh, for $2 only. So you can show your wife and you will never have problems. <laughs> <laughs> now that, that is what I'm talking about. That is what folks uh, need to know. And that's what I always think about when uh, I make orders from Omnia. Uh, mm. uh, the lifetime order list that I'm going to acquire over my life from Omnia is going to be a problem that I hope my future wife will never see, right? Like my girlfriend right now, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you, 
I, it was, you know, here's my order, but everyone knows that uh, we all know how much more that we spend on tackle than we may tell people. Well, you don't know it, this. It, it, you don't even know this, Aiden. You don't know it yet, but you already own me money because when we were talking previously, you, you uh, mentioned Omina and I went to check the website and unfortunately I found some good stuff over there. That was there we go. So you nice. already owe me some money, buddy. <laughs> 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 I like it. I like it. Well, that's uh, just to kind of wrap things up here, Marcos. The biggest thing with with this show, the reason Business from the Vessel was created was um, the passion that people have yeah. in the fishing industry and in any any industry in general. I'm on the same boat with you. Um, you got to have that passion and then the money's the byproduct. And yes. um, that passion side is is why people start brands like Waterwood and yourself and, and those situations. And so um, – Alignment of values there. I really like that. Uh, so how I like to wrap up every show, a couple of things. Number one, um, because you have been so versed in this industry from guiding product development with Iowa and then now with what you're doing, um, what advice would you have to someone that's looking to get into the fishing industry? This is exactly what we were talking about. Follow your passion. Mm. Be, you've got to be tenacious, man. You know, nothing is easy, nothing that is, you know, there's a saying that if it's worth the, the, the price, it's worth the fight. Mm -hmm. uh, you you got to put your passion first. Uh, uh, if you look, if, if you enter the tackle business with the approach of only money, uh, you may be successful, but very difficult uh, uh, because you're dealing with people that they are not buying something because of the value mm -hmm. of that product. They are buying something. They are buying a passion. They are buying a dream. Oh, man, I'm going to buy this water wood here and I'm going to catch me a six-pounder or I'm going to win the tournament. I'm going to have an edge. And this is not a I – don't, I don't take this as a rational decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's some rational decision on it, but – a lot of it is emotional, so really you have to to be to be very resilient to to keep on it. And second thing, be consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, consistency for me is the name of the game. Like on Waterwood, we we sell baits and we are not perfect. These baits are all handmade. It's a difficult process. It's a very uh, a lot of steps on the process. So sometimes we fail. Sometimes we have a bait that does not work properly, even though we, we test water every bait. We do the best as we can. We do the sealing, sealant on the baits the best as we can. But once in a while, there's a failure. Yeah. Uh, we stand behind the product. Customers can call us anytime. I always put my phone number, my email address. Can call us anytime. We stand behind the product because we are not selling something that I want the guy to buy here and be done. You know, be done with it. I want the guy to say, man, this thing is built to help me to achieve that dream. This is why I built to win. It's helped me to, to get on that place that is, there's, you know, you go to a tournament, doesn't matter the size of the tournament, maybe 10 boats, maybe 50, maybe 30, maybe 200. Same mentality. Those oh guys, they are, they are serious, man. Yeah, they, I, I want to win just as bad at at, at exactly thirty boat jackpot as yeah, I do in a two hundred boat. Yeah. Everybody has blood on their eyes, man. They they are going for it. So so, if we sell something, we got to stand behind. So trying to answer a question, you know, follow our passion, be consistent, you know, and stand behind your product. You know, time will will, will bring you about. If you if you don't give up, time will bring you about. It's like fishing, you know. When, when I arrived in America and I went bass fishing here, I called my partner in Brazil and he, he said, first time that I, I went fishing, he, 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 he called me, I called him after the fishing day. And he said, how it go? I said, man, I don't even know how to cast. I was fishing with Todd Ott and the guy was skipping docks, man. And I was looking at the guy and said, I'm not, never going to be able to do that. Wow. And man, I had I bought a bass boat, start fish here on Lake Wiley. I had days that I came out of the water, man. I was in such a bad mood, so frustrated that I could not even talk. 
<laughs> getting back to my house and my wife was like, man, you go fishing, supposed to be happy. You can be uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, cranky and, and frustrated. But I talked to the guys in the dock and I had one or two bites and the guys go like, oh my gosh, they were chomping today. They were eating today. And I go like, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh-huh. If, if you I don't give that. up, if you do it long enough and, and, and really believe, you get it. And, and that's the one of the beauty of bass fishing. And I believe also the Best fishing industry. Yeah. People help each other. Oh, my gosh. That's the coolest part of the industry. Yeah, exactly. Tournament anglers, man. A lot of people, of course, they they will not tell you exactly where they caught that fish. Maybe they don't tell you exactly the the small details on it. But they will give you a pretty good idea. You know, the majority, of course. Uh, There are always some people that if they're fishing north, they'll tell you to go south. (laughs) But... The majority is very cool. They, they help you. And fishing industry is the same. We, we had a super cool experience at the Best Master Classic this year. We had a booth. Mm-hmm. And we are side by we were side by side with a company called Beast Baits. Uh-huh. They make soft baits and they uh, merged the company with another solid brand here from the Carolinas called True Soft. They make great jigs and uh, spinner baits. Mm-hmm. And we were working side by side different products, you know, but still trying to to reach that customer. And yeah. they were helping us and we were helping them, them as much as they can, as much as we could, and they were doing the same. And the guys do not even know us. You know, we know each other by hello, hi, but not, yeah. not that we know each other. So this is one of the great advantages of the industry here. You know, like people like you, Aiden, you have the, the, the Serious Angler podcast, Mm-hmm. And you reach out for a guy that's basically a nobody, you know, reach out to him for Marcos, this guy from Brazil that has terrible English. <laughs> no, no. Brazilian redneck, I'm going to give him an opportunity. <laughs> that goes to show that America. And, and I always make a joke and I want to ask you the question. It's not a joke. It's something serious. But to prove my point, I'm going to ask you a question that I know before I ask you the question, I know that you don't know the answer. Okay. I doubt that you have the right answer. Yeah. Can I ask you? Sure. What makes America the most amazing country in the world? That you can build a business around your passion. That's a byproduct. It's true, but it's a byproduct. That we're, uh, what do we got? What, what's the answer? The answer is the American people, Mm. is you guys. You guys have a heart to help. Look, man, any disaster in the world, America is sending people, money. America is always there. Uh, You Americans, you have that heart to help. I guess you cannot... You know, you cannot cannot avoid it. It's something that's that's, that's like in your genetics. Aidan, let me tell a a, a fishing story. Mm -hmm. In 19... 87, I was 20 years old. That okay. goes to show you how old I am. <laughs> I'm so old, Aiden, that when I was really young in Brazil, I used to walk outside in my, my backyard and there were dinosaurs over there. <laughs> That's how old I am. But so in 1987, I was hired by a very wealthy gentleman. I was a farmer in Brazil. Okay. And he bought a big property up north on the border of the Amazon rainforest. Okay. And he had the land, but he was trying to keep the land. He was trying not to open for pasture, to not take the trees. He was a very cautious guy, a very nice guy. And he said, I may do a fishing lodge over there, but I don't know nothing about fishing. Would you go over there? By the time I was writing on several magazines in Brazil and doing some fishing shows, so I had kind of a name. And so he hired me to go over there and do some prospecting on the property. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's in the middle of the jungle, man. Aiden took us uh, eight hours to drive 120 miles. Oh, wow. On, on, on dirt road. So, real, so bad, real, man. We, we yeah, were bumpy and just. Yeah. Rough so when we arrived over there, there was this couple taking care of the land. And they were descendants of uh, uh, native Brazilian Indians, native, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So they have the uh, the, the the traces, the lines, the I don't know how to say the eth the ethnicity of the the Indians, and they are Genetics. super. People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are beloved people. So I arrived over there, introduced myself. The guy came and introduced himself to me, and I said, "What's your name?" And he goes like Elijah. I go like Elijah. You're from the uh, Kaikubi tribe, and you have a biblical name. How come? How is that possible? Sure. He said, no, I'll explain you how it's possible. About 50 years ago, some American missionaries came by, oh, and wow. they taught the whole tribe about God. They, they, they taught, they, they preached the gospel, and they, they taught us about God and everything else. And my grandmother learned that, and she learned to read, to be able to read the Bible, and she was really in the Bible. So every one of her children and her grandchildren had by, by biblical names. names. Yes. Wow. And that's wow. due to the American people. Can you imagine in the probably in the late seven, uh, 1800s, I guess, mm -hmm. some missionaries going to the Amazon rainforest, reaching out for tribes. They were really wild by the time. So you Americans do that. That's the heart of America. And this is why everything is possible here because you guys help each other. Even we, we came here, we were, nobody ever heard about Waterwood. And I go to stores and 90% of the time, oh yes, man, we're going to give it a try. We're going to give you wow. an opportunity. Wow. So that's what makes America, in my opinion, you know, such a special country. It's the help. Wow. That's great. That's a great uh, perspective and, and a good way to wrap things up. That's fantastic, Marcos. The, the last question I have um, would be your largest, and this was cool because you traveled the Elite Series stuff, so you may have been on some big smallmouth fisheries, that kind of a thing too, but largest smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and spotted bass, and, and what you caught them on. Hmm. I may disappoint you. I don't have many big fish. Well, my largest spotted bass was on Norman winter time. Was on a tournament, caught it on a speed trap crankbait. Oh yeah, yeah. Out of rip wrap early, early in the morning was a five and a half. Oh man, that's a yeah. that's a big yeah. spot. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Now they are catching a lot bigger than that, but by the time it was a big fish. I had an opportunity in from ninety to ninety two. I live in California. I did a little bit, uh, went to Santa Barbara City College as a international student, mm -hmm. and I studied a little bit of uh, marine biology. Okay, very uh, cool. It was not a full graduation, but I did for two years, and I had an opportunity to fish a lot of bass lakes. I fished Kachuma Lake, Caziras Lake. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Just spent some time on the Southwest. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's and I cool. was super blessed, man. I caught a huge largemouth bass there. I caught a 14.7. Oh, my Yes. Gosh. And believe yeah. it or not, I caught it on a tube. By the time they used to use a tube, a big tube called a Tora tube. Yeah. Was it on a bed? No, man. was a – well, I, I made a good friend over there. His name was Danny Joe. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a Texas man lived to California, married a California girl, and he was almost retiring. He had a champion boat. Oh, yeah. We became such good, yeah, we became such good friends that he used to lend me his boat. I was, you know, a student and no money. and So he was super cool. He got to lend me his boat and his truck. Wow. So I could go fishing sometimes, practicing for us when we were fishing some tournaments together. Yeah. And uh, uh, so it was using his graph, he had a Lawrence X-16. I will never forget. It was a paper graph. Wow. And I went <laughs> over some brush, man, and I saw those two big arches on it. And I go like, my gosh, those are big fish. You know, I don't know what they are. So I stopped the boat and fired that tube over there. And sure enough, man, I had the bite. Set the hook, fought the fish, brought the fish to the boat, put the fish on the net, and as I swung net the fish, the, the tube came out of his mouth. 
Wow. So it was an amazing fish. Uh, by the time they had a program over there that you could bring the fish alive to the uh, station for the game fishing. Yeah. And they would donate the fish alive. They were trying to to take some, to make the fish yeah. spawn. Yeah. Yes. Yes. S yes. Similar to Texas now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar to Sri Lanka. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was my biggest largemouth bears. And my biggest. A uh, smallmouth bass was uh, on Angie's territory, was in Buffalo, New York. Uh huh. Yeah. I was fishing a tournament as a coangler. Yeah. First time was fun. First time I drew a guy from up north on Lake Erie that had a gambler boat. Oh, man. So I'm fishing on Erie on those waves, and that boat was flooded half of the time. Yeah. But the guy yeah. was a guide over there, a great tournament angler. So we done great first day. It was only three fish for co-anglers. So yeah. first day I fish with him. Second day I fish with uh, Marty Robinson from South uh -huh. Carolina. Uh -huh. And I caught a big, 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 big uh, uh, smallmouth bass. And Marty was super kind with me. He's an amazing guy. When he saw the fish, he go like, man, I'm going to help you. Because by that time, the English could help the co anglers and vice versa to land the fish. Yep, yep. It was choppy, so he helped me to land the fish. Well, that was, a for me, it was a big fish. It was a 6'2". That's a giant. You, yeah, I can't believe you said, you, you're like, oh, I don't know about my answers. I think those are some of the, I think a 14.7 is the largest. I ask every guest this, right? So that, yeah. that I think, was the largest largemouth I've heard. I mean, a lot of guys. Todd Castledine, Texas, you know, kind of, I don't know, it was 10, 12, 13, maybe, you know, is the highest I've heard. But that's yeah. the biggest, a 6'2 smallmouth, I mean, giant, yeah. a five and a half on spot. Like, that's, I, those are some of the best numbers I've heard, Marcus. Yeah, and I, I, I'm a pretty good liar, but trying to convince people about my lies, uh -huh. I, I, I got the measurements of the fish and we, we, we did a fiberglass replica. Oh, very cool. And I have here in my back the biggest peacock bass that I caught was a 26. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, that one in the top. And the large mark in the back was the 14.7. At least true. the measurements, you know, as close as possible. Sure. But uh, wow. And since I released the fish, nobody can prove me wrong. So I keep telling the same story. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That is fantastic. Well, Marcos, um, I really appreciate you coming on and hearing your story with Waterwood Customs. Uh, for folks interested, check out waterwoodcustombaits.com. Go through. The galleries are incredible. And then uh, go to that dealer page. Look through, uh, look through where you can, you can get some uh, purchased. And uh, can't wait to see where this brand takes you, Marcos. It's been an awesome journey so far in the four years. And um, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Aidan. I just want to say thank you to you, Andy and Bailey, for the opportunity, all the friends that follow you guys, all the subscribers. Amazing opportunity for us to be here. We are a small company and to get uh, to be invited on your show, it's a unique opportunity. So we are the ones to say thank you. I appreciate it. That is, that is fantastic. Awesome, guys. Well, Marcos, thanks for coming on. Enjoy, uh, enjoy some time fishing here in the heat in South Carolina, <laughs> but, uh, best of luck. And, uh, I'm sure we'll connect down the road. Okay, cool. Well, listen, before I let you go, February, put on your agenda. Okay. We have a commitment on Santi Cooper. All right. February at Santi Cooper. Gosh, you're welcome, buddy. Blast. That's, you, you're going to like it. That's awesome. I, All right, I'm, man. I'm not a good guide. I'm not a good fisherman, but that lake is full of fish. So we'll catch them. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I've spoken like a true guide. It's not me, but this place has got them. So yes, we'll be okay. That's, it. that's true. Awesome. Appreciate All right. It. Well, have Thank a great you. rest of your day. Same to you guys. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>